Happy Saturday, everybody. Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. It has been a very busy week. I normally try to get everything, all the salient developments, into six episodes, but there has been just so much on this week. I could not、uh, figure what I could possibly leave out of today's episode. So for this week, we will do two episodes over the weekend: one today, which we're releasing today, and then another tomorrow. I know that Sunday is normally a day of rest for you all. I hope you will forgive two episodes over the weekend instead of one. It is the weekend, of course, so it will be a very foreign policy. Geopolitical focused video for today, and today's focus before we dive into some economic、uh, updates at the end of the episode will primarily be on China-Japan relations. If you enjoy the video, don't forget to the like button. Let's begin. As we discussed earlier this week, Japan began releasing treated water from the damaged Fukushima reactor facility into the ocean on Thursday, in anticipation for the release. The Austria-based International Atomic Energy Agency published a special report on the decision, which concluded, "Quote: Based on its comprehensive assessment, the IAEA has concluded that the approach and activities." To the discharge of ALPS treated water taken by Japan are consistent with relevant international safety standards. Furthermore, the IAEA notes the controlled gradual discharges of the treated water to the sea, as currently planned, would have a negligible radiological impact on people and the environment. End quote. However, China has strongly advocated against the decision by Tokyo, engaging unsuccessfully in a year-long campaign internationally and domestically to prevent it from happening. While many Chinese officials and citizens likely are genuinely concerned about the release of treated radioactive water into the ocean in their region, deep mutual animosity and mistrust between China and Japan, in part tied to historical grievances as well as Japan's role as a critical ally of the United States. In East Asia, means that what can begin as a legitimate Chinese concern or criticism of Japanese behavior can often escalate into a much more dubiously founded and, frankly, quite ugly anger at Japan. This is what we have seen very much this week: unbridled nationalism, especially in China, but also in Japan. Doesn't help the situation either. The PRC's reaction to Japan this week has been nothing less than furious, with both more denunciations and a total ban on the import of aquatic products from all of Japan. Which we will cover the implications of shortly. On Thursday, at a regular press event, Japanese media outlet Asahi TV asked Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin, "Quote: The Japanese government fully explained that there is no problem with the nuclear-treated water, and the IAEA also agreed with that. Most of the countries of the world are not opposed to discharging the water. Why doesn't China believe the conclusion made by Japan and this international organization?" End quote. In response, Wang rearticulated Beijing's official position that the government quote failed to provide the legitimacy and legality of the ocean discharge decision, and failed to have thorough consultations with other stakeholders. End quote. And that quote the Chinese government will continue to put the well-being of people first. End quote. State media discourse has been less diplomatic in its language, of course. State-run Global Times, speaking to a research fellow at the Institute of Japanese Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Studies, this week reported, quote, "The dumping will undoubtedly have a very negative impact on the national image of Japan, as well as on the safety of Japanese brands, especially food." End quote. Popular discourse on Japan has been very fiery this week too. Shanghai-based media outlet Sixth Tone writes yesterday that quote the news has been trending on Chinese social media for several days, with many posts attacking Japan. End quote. On Weibo, China's biggest social media platform in terms of views, a hashtag announcing the beginning of the wastewater release. Had gained 1.9 billion views as of Thursday afternoon. One comment on a state-run CCTV post with over 125,000 likes expressed, "Quote: The Earth can exist without Japan, but it cannot exist without the oceans." End quote. 
Several Chinese uh, cartoonists contributed to the Angry Discourse too. This is one prominent example which went viral online. In a poll conducted by Sena Weibo, more than 200,000 netizens said that they would, quote, never patronize Japanese restaurants again, end quote. One comment with thousands of upvotes expressed, quote, Japan's practice of contaminating the sea is incomprehensible and unforgivable, end quote. Of course, Japan's media and public have been watching and reacting to this uh, sea of statements coming from China. While within Japan, there are, of course, some concerned too with the government decision to discharge the water. But the mainstream view appears to be that Beijing's opposition is not coming from a place of good faith. Common Japanese retorts to the PRC position include 1. Beijing's own poor record of environmental protection. Two, China's own policy of discharging, arguably, much more questionable water into the sea from its own nuclear facilities at several locations across the country. And, of course, three, comparing Japan's comparatively open and transparent internationally engaged review process in relation to this decision to discharge the wastewater versus China's behavior in relation to the origins of COVID-19 specifically and the global pandemic generally. Now moving to the economic consequences, China announced an all-out ban on Japanese aquatic products yesterday, Friday. The market reaction to the news was quick. The average price of fresh Amori tuna at the Toyosu market fell 24% on Friday versus just one day before. Japanese Finance Minister Suzuki, at a post-cabinet press conference yesterday, called on China to immediately lift the embargo. China is the largest single market for Japanese seafood exports at 87.1 billion yen, 600 million US dollars, last year, according to government trade statistics. One Daiwa Institute of Research Economist observed that, quote, half of Japan's fisheries exports go to China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, which means fishermen would lose 50% of their overseas sales, a considerable blow, end quote. However, while those sectors that are affected, including high-end Japanese restaurants within China itself, will feel the bite, at the national level, in Japan, the economic pain will be mild. Namora Research Institute economist Takahide Kyoti expressed in a column that seafood exports to mainland China and Hong Kong account for only 0.17% of total exports and that, quote, the impact on Japan's exports and economy is limited. End quote. He adds, however, that if China's trade restrictions on Japan expand to other sectors, then, quote, the Japanese economy will suffer a much more serious blow. End quote. What is critical for us to note, though, is that China's ban on Japanese seafood is much more about politics than economics. Stefan Akrik, a senior economist at Moody's Analytics, wrote in an investor note this week, quote, The Fukushima water release is mostly of political and environmental significance. Economically, the ramifications of a potential ban on Japanese food shipments are minimal. End quote. With this in mind, let's end part one of today's video with this observation. Quote, Japan is not going to stop the years long release. So how does the PRC eventually walk back, or do they have to just keep escalating? Is there a master plan from the PRC side? And do they think it will get the Japanese to stop the release? Or is much of this just about directing anger at Japan? What measures against Japan might be next? Targeted and encouraged protests against Japanese companies and diplomatic facilities in the PRC, like the ones that occurred in September 2012? Raids, inspections of some Japanese firms in the PRC? End quote. One thing is for sure, expect Tokyo to continue to move closer to Washington and her allies. Next up, the Chinese economy. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. It's a huge help for the channel if you like, share and subscribe. It's just me making these episodes six days a week, but your support is always a huge source of motivation. And for those of you who want to go the extra mile and help me keep China Update financially sustainable, free episodes for everyone six days, or in this case, seven days a week. Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Next up, we need to cover a few important economic stories before we move into next week. In a very telling move, on Thursday, the China Securities Regulatory Commission, China's top securities regulator, summoned executives of financial institutions, including national pensions 
and some large banks and insurers to push them to expand mid- to long-term investment in the stock market in order to shore up stock prices. This comes as China's prolonged housing crisis, the economic slowdown and geopolitical uncertainty have made the nation's stock market among the worst global performers this year. The index has erased all gains since last month's Politburo meeting and lost 8.8% of its value over the past year. China has taken a series of steps to bolster the stock market recently, from cutting stock transaction fees to considering an extension of trading hours, but so far this has seen little success. Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin writes yesterday, quote, China's financial market is stuck in a downward spiral as concerns build about the gloomy outlook for the world's second largest economy. End quote. Investors watching all of this will likely be asking, however, if Beijing needs to direct some of its financial institutions to buy up stocks, just how confident in the price fundamentals can they really be? Regulators were not finished, however. The following day, Friday, yesterday, the Ministry of Urban Rural Development and Housing, the People's Bank of China, China's Central Bank, and the National Administration of Financial Regulation jointly unveiled yet more easing measures in the hopes of reviving China's sick property market. According to state-run Xinhua, the measures will allow local governments to make mortgages more accessible to households. The government said that it will also extend the personal income tax rebates for people who buy new homes after selling old homes as well. In a sign of just how promise fatigued and pessimistic the market is, the stock market rally at the news lasted only 10 minutes. Then within 20 minutes, all the gains from that mild rally were lost. In one particularly grim hot take, one Hong Kong trader exclaimed that China's economy is unsavable. The CSI 300 index was down by the end of trading. Quote, the policy is certainly positive and supportive to housing demand, but in terms of its impact on the property market, we will need more time for confidence and sentiment to recover under the downward spiral of home prices. We're not at a turning point yet. End quote. Other commentators argue that these measures do absolutely nothing. For example, Peking University Professor of Finance Michael Pettis expressed at the news, quote, Removing a purchase constraint will boost purchases when people want to buy but can't because of the constraint. It will not have much effect if people are not eager to buy. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much everybody for watching. Have a wonderful Saturday and I will see you all tomorrow.